can you as a member of the ummah actually become a member of a nation state? In other words, is it permissible for a Muslim to leave the confines of the ummah geographically, not theologically, but geographically, and to take up permanent abode, permanent residence in a nation state that is not a part of the ummah? Now, the response to this, the nation state, as we said, is a modern phenomenon. There were no defined countries a hundred years ago. Countries' borders kept on changing. But the issue arose, the question arose, and the scholars of the past did discuss this issue. Is it permissible for Muslims who are a part of the Ummah to leave the geographic regions of the Ummah and take up residence outside of those regions and live amongst other communities that do not profess Islam? And there are a number of opinions out there. We'll summarize them into three primary ones. The first position is the accepted position in the Hanafi, Shafi'i and Hanbali schools. And they say that it is permissible for a Muslim to reside in a non-Muslim land as long as the Muslim can freely practice his or her religion. They can pray and fast and be a Muslim in their personal lives. They may do so, but it is best for them to live in a Darul Islam. It is permissible to live in Darul Kufr if they can be Muslim, but it is not to be encouraged. In direct contradiction to this is the Maliki position. Generally speaking, the Malikis were the most harshest and they have the longest treatises and fatwas against this. And they say it is completely, totally impermissible for a Muslim ever to live amongst non-Muslims. And the reason why the Malikis were so strict where were the Malikis geographically based? North Africa and Spain. What happened in Spain? The Inquisition. They saw with their eyes what happens when Muslims remain behind in non-Muslim lands. They saw it and they said, how can we possibly allow a future generation to undergo another Inquisition? And so the Malikis reacted like anybody would. And they said, no way, no way. It's just not possible for a Muslim to ever, ever, ever reside in non-Muslim lands. He has to do whatever he can to get back to Muslim territories. That is the other extreme. There are a few positions in the middle, one of them being that of the famous Shafi'i scholar, Al-Mawardi. Al-Mawardi said, as long as a Muslim is able to practice his or her religion in a non-Muslim land, he should remain in the non-Muslim land. It's the opposite of the majority. The majority said he should emigrate to Muslim lands. Al-Mawardi said no he should remain in non-Muslim lands. And of course his reasoning is that the very fact that there's a Muslim in such a land is a very positive fact. That this person will be able to communicate, tell others about his religion, be an example of Islam to fellow human beings. And so Al-Mawardi said, this person takes on the responsibility of the prophets. He takes on the responsibility of the Rusul. Of course, he doesn't become one, but he takes on the responsibility. And that is to spread the message of Islam. Therefore, he should remain in those lands. Now, scholars used evidences to discuss these issues. And it is important we discuss some of them because the average layperson sometimes hears a khutbah, an imam, a fatwa, a faqih, where these evidences are quoted. So I do want to mention some of the primary evidences on both sides so that we have an understanding of why people People say what? The primary reason why many of the scholars said we shouldn't live in non-Muslim lands is due to a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that says, "Ana min kulli Muslimin al-mushrikeen." I have nothing to do with any Muslim who lives amongst mushrikeen. I have nothing to do with such a person. Ana bari. I free myself from him. Now, this is one of the evidences. Another evidence is a verse in the Quran, Surah An-Nisa, where Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala says in the Quran that inna alladhina tawaffahum al-malaa'ikatu zalimi anfusihim. When the angels come to take your souls and you have done sins and the angels ask them, "What were you doing?" Fima kuntum? These people will say, "Qalu kunna mustad'afina fil ard." We were oppressed in the land. We were forced to commit these sins. We had to live these evil lives because we had no other choice. So the angels will tell them, and this is a verse in Surah An-Nisa, أَلَمْ تَكُنْ أَرْضُ اللَّهِ وَاسِعَةً فَتُهَاجِرُوا فِيهَا Didn't or wasn't the land of Allah a very vast land so that you could have immigrated somewhere else? 
Notice the verse, angels come, ask the people, what were you doing? Muslims, the Muslims respond, we were weak and oppressed. We weren't able to do what we're supposed to do. The angels don't say, okay, fine, no big deal. You're forgiven. The angels say, if that was the case, why didn't you go somewhere else? أَلَمْ تَكُنْ أَرْضُ اللَّهِ وَاسِعًا Wasn't the ard of Allah a huge land? فَتُهَاجِرُوا Make hijrah somewhere else. If you can't worship Allah in land X, go to land Y. These are the two primary evidences used by those who say we should not live in non-Muslim lands, in nation states. In opposition to this, the majority position says we may live there with conditions and they base their evidences as well on a number of points. First and foremost, they say this verse is an evidence against you and not for you. This verse is not an evidence for your position, it's an evidence against your position. How so? Because these people were not able to practice Islam. They were not punished merely for living in a geographic region. They were punished for not being good Muslims. So if you can be a good Muslim, the angels will not question you where you lived. You guys following this logic? If you can be a good Muslim, the angels will not question you why were you living in Darul Kufr. As long as you live righteous lives, the angels will take your souls in peace and content. And inshaAllah ta'ala, that is that. So the majority do say, this is the position, you're only allowed to live in other lands that are not ruled by the Sharia as long as you can live your life as a good Muslim. You know, you're not forced to commit idolatry. You're not forced to commit major sins. You're free to pray, to fast. As long as you're able to do the pillars of Islam and you're not forced to do major sins, you are free to live there if you so choose to do so. And they also say, as for the hadith that you quoted, I am free of any Muslim living amongst uh, pagans. First and foremost, there's a huge dispute, is this hadith authentic or not? Even Imam al-Bukhari himself said the hadith is not authentic. But even if it is authentic, the scholars say, you guys forgot to mention why the Prophet ﷺ said this. The context of the hadith. What is the context of the hadith? What happened once was that the Prophet ﷺ sent an expedition to launch a raid on a certain locality. And that locality was known to be a pagan locality. The tribe was a pagan tribe. So when the raid, when the, when the expedition was launched and the Muslims went, and they managed to capture a few and kill a few. It so turned out later on that some of those who had been killed were Muslims living there secretly. People who had converted, but they didn't come to Medina. They just remained in their tribes. And after they were killed accidentally by Muslims, their relatives or others told them, oh, they had converted to Islam. And so the Muslims felt very guilty. The Muslims felt very guilty. This was not a permissible act to do. The Prophet ﷺ said, this is not your fault. That's the meaning of the hadith. It's not my responsibility. It doesn't mean I have nothing to do. This is a wrong translation. The proper translation, anabari, it is not my responsibility. If a Muslim lives in non-Muslim lands and something happens there, I cannot be held responsible for that. That was a choice they made. It doesn't mean they were sinful. It means now that they have been killed, it's not the Muslim ummah's fault. No blood money needs to be paid. You, O Muslims who did this, are not guilty for what you have done. Because you launched a valid, legitimate expedition. And it so happened that there happened to be Muslims there. So they met their fate. It's not that they died in sin. They met their fate, but you, O Muslims, are not guilty. I am not guilty. The Muslim state is not guilty. And so we are not guilty of any crime of having had these people killed accidentally. This is the meaning of the hadith. I cannot be responsible. So it doesn't mean that a person who lives there is in and of itself sinful. Also, they quote a very beautiful hadith, which actually solves the whole issue. And this hadith is narrated in Ibn Hibban, when a certain Bedouin by the name of Fudayk converted to Islam. And Fudayk converted to Islam and his tribe remained upon shirk. He was told that his Islam was imperfect until he migrated to Medina. Now remember, we're talking about not just there is a Islamic state, there is the Islamic state up and running. This is not just an Islamic empire. This is the land of Islam under the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu So Fudayk is told, unless you emigrate to Medina, something is wrong with your Islam. Your Islam is not full. Fudayk was so worried that he traveled all the way to Medina to ask the Prophet Sallallahu directly, do I have to come to Medina or not? And so he says, Ya Rasulullah, people are saying that whoever doesn't emigrate, i.e. to Medina, will never be successful. Look at what the Prophet ﷺ said. He said, O Fudayk, establish the prayer, avoid sin, and live with your people wherever you like. This is really the hadith is a clincher as they say. Establish the prayer, avoid committing sins, 
and live wherever you want. Your people are living wherever they want, go and live with them. And so this hadith clearly tells us that in and of itself, geographic location does not incur any sin. You can live wherever you want as long as you're able to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala freely without committing any major sins. Therefore, the strongest position is that it is completely legitimate for a member of the ummah to leave the geographic regions of the ummah and take up residence anywhere else, whether it's a nation state, whether it's a tribal system, whether it's any other uh, type of community, anywhere a Muslim is able to be a Muslim. And what does it mean to be a Muslim? It means you establish the prayer, you're able to fast Ramadan, you're able to give the zakah, and you're not forced to do major sins. You're not forced to drink, to fornicate, to uh, commit idolatry. As long as you're able to be a Muslim, you may live wherever you want. What if somebody says, now hold on a sec, you cannot be a perfect Muslim until the laws of society around you are also Islamic. The response to this is, this is not true. It's simply not true. You can be a perfect Muslim, a good Muslim, like the Sahaba were in Mecca, like the Sahaba were in Abyssinia, even if the society around you is not establishing the laws of Islam. Islam as a system cannot be perfected until there is a full legitimate political establishment. Yes, that is agreed upon. Islam as a full system needs to be manifested. But me as a Muslim, if my context, if my situation does not allow for that, then that doesn't mean I am sinful. I am doing what I need to do, like the Muslims of Mecca and the Muslims of Abyssinia. And we will come back to these two examples over and over again. So this is the first issue. The second issue, once we've decided that yes, a person from the Ummah can be a member of the nation state, no problem. Now the question arises, okay, you can live here, but why are you living here? What is your goal as a member of the Ummah now that you're a member of the nation state? There are a number of groups out there that all have different agendas. Of course, we have the extreme militant groups who claim that it is our physical jihad duty to fight the entire earth until we enter it into the ummah. And alhamdulillah, this is a very minority position. And these are the people who are committing acts of terrorism in the name of our religion. They think they're doing something good. And this has been refuted in many different times and places. And inshallah, even later on, uh, we will continue to show that this is not the prophetic methodology. This is not the reality of jihad but there are groups that claim yes we need to physically fight each and every country until it comes under the ummah and this is something by the way none of the khulafa as a whole did for the entire earth not the umayyas not the abbasas not the ottomans they understood there's a time and a place and a legitimate reason when and where and how to engage in warfare in any case this is an extreme fringe that through violent methods they want to convert every nation state into the ummah that we said is not only a minority but to be brutally honest no serious scholar, no major anim of our era has considered this type of methodology to be justified. There is another methodology and that methodology is, okay, it is our duty now that we're here to convert the nation state into the ummah, not by violent means, but by peaceful means. Not by violence, but by peaceful means. How so? How will we convert the ummah by peaceful means? Preaching and teaching. Da'wah, i.e. da'wah and tabliq. So we're going to preach to the masses and and we're going to tell them about our religion and our ultimate goal. Our only reason for being in any nation state is so that we can eventually transform the nation state into a part of the ummah, but not by violent means, through peaceful means. So when a majority of people of any country become practicing Muslims, and then they want to establish the Sharia, then they should establish the Sharia like any democracy, like any republic, like any group of people, they should judge according to their own laws. So this is also a very standard position. And in fact, it has been popularized since the 70s and particularly by a number of movements. I don't want to mention names here or a number of scholars as well. Some of the scholars, I mean, alhamdulillah, we all love them and respect them. Abu Hassan, Ali Nadwi, others. They basically said, and this is the liner that we have all heard so many times. If our niyyah is da'wah, that's the only reason we're allowed to be a part of the nation state. And the ultimate goal must be to convert everybody around us so that eventually through peaceful means, not through terrorism, terrorist means, not through evil means, not through violent means, through peaceful means, this country and every country becomes Darul Islam. 
And so with this in mind, this really made me ask the question that is it really a requirement of our religion that our ultimate aim is to overthrow the very country we're staying in? I mean, I heard this as a child as well in my Sunday schools, in halaqat, in durus, in khutbas. The only reason we can live in this country is to give da'wah. If we don't give da'wah, we're not allowed to be here. It is haram to live here anymore. Well, you know, alhamdulillah, I'm not just a Friday attender anymore. Alhamdulillah, I'm a student of knowledge. I can go back to the books. I know what our tradition, our ulama said. And I really discovered an amazing fact. This conception is a very modern conception. In fact, to be honest, it's a conception of our century, 1960s and 70s. And it was popularized by a number of movements, no need to mention names here, but these activist movements that started in Egypt and Pakistan and that came here with this goal in mind. And the reality is our sharia does not require us to aim to overthrow any government that you're having to live in. And the best example, I don't have time to go into all the details. The best example of this is the example of the Muslims living in Abyssinia. This is an example we need to put in front of our eyes. The Muslims living in Abyssinia. Let us contextualize the situation. The Muslims in Mecca cannot worship Allah properly. The Muslims in Mecca are persecuted, tortured, killed. You all know the stories of Ammar ibn Yasir, of Bilal, of, of, of Sumayya, of all of these Sahaba who became shaheeds or were tortured severely in Mecca. The Prophet ﷺ and how he was ridiculed. You all know this. There is no Darul Islam in existence. What does the Prophet ﷺ do? He allows 100 Muslims. That is like maybe 50% of the Ummah at that time. That's a huge amount for the time. He allows a huge percentage of Muslims to go to another Darul Kufr. So not all Darul Kufrs are the same. Some are better than others. And what does he tell these Muslims? He tells them, listen to this, you are going to go to a country that has a just Christian king, Najashi. He will not harm you for your religion. He will not harm you for your religion. You will be able to be religious people. So go there. You will be able to worship Allah over there, unlike in Mecca. So go there. So the Muslims went 100. And by the way, 100, we might think it's a small number. For those days, 100, this is like three, four tribes. This is a huge number. It's a very big number. 100 strangers coming into your country and living and taking up residence. You all know the story, what happened. The Quraysh came to try to get them back. What did the Muslims do of Abyssinia? They fought in the courts of Najashi. They utilized the systems of Najashi. There is no Sharia court. There is no Islamic court. What do they do? They go to the very courts of Najashi, the highest court in the land in front of Najashi. And they argue their case. This is the Supreme Court over here. They argue their case passionately, not based upon Islamic principles, based upon universal principles of justice and fairness. Look at the evidences that, that Ja'far ibn Abi Talib used. He didn't say Allah commands us that we must live here. He didn't say the Prophet ﷺ commanded us we have to come here, whether you like it or not, tough luck. He realized this is now up to Najashi. Obviously with the permission of Allah. The ruling is for Najashi in this particular case. Obviously whatever Allah wills. So he has to convince Najashi based upon Najashi's system of justice and not based upon the Sharia. So what does he do? He appeals to Najashi's sense of fairness. He says, you are a just king. You allow people to be who they are. We are righteous religious people. We believe in Jesus Christ. You all know the story. The key point here, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib argued in front of Najashi, in the court of Najashi, Najashi using the techniques of Najashi. And nobody complained. Nobody said, A'udhu Billah, this is kufr. A'udhu Billah, you cannot do this. It's a matter of life and death. You either live your life as Muslims in Abyssinia, or that's it, you're going back to Mecca, and you're going to face persecution and torture. And the Prophet ﷺ allowed these hundred Muslims to live in Abyssinia for almost one decade. They lived in Abyssinia for one decade almost. Medina was established. The Muslims are still in Abyssinia. Badr is fought. The Muslims Muslims are still in Abyssinia. Uhud is fought, the Muslims are in Abyssinia. Ahzab is fought, they're still in Abyssinia. Khandaq is fought, they're still in Abyssinia. And then finally, when the battle is fought against the Yahud, the final battle against the Yahud, the Bani Quraidah, that is when the Prophet sends for Ja'far and says, come back. Why at this stage? Why after seven years of the Hijrah did the Prophet tell Ja'far to come back? Scholars say Ja'far ibn Abi Talib was the backup plan. If the Muslims cannot live in Medina, they're all going to go to Abyssinia. There's a backup plan. If we don't succeed, 
in Medina, at least we'll have a place to live. But when finally every major opponent is off of the picture, then the Prophet says to Ja'far, come back and live with us. Now during those years, those 10 years that they lived there, the Muslims picked up the language, the culture, the cuisine. They picked up the elements of society that they happened to be a part of. They talked about the religion, but they never once plotted and planned to establish a Khilafah in Abyssinia. They never once thought of how can we overthrow the Najashi and make it into Darul Islam. Because they realized that would not be fair and proper. Najashi invited them in to be a part of his land on the condition they worship Allah, but let them be. Don't get involved in our system and want to overthrow it. You are allowed to worship Allah. Fine, you have that freedom. So the Muslims understood this. And therefore, neither Ja'far ibn Abi Talib nor did the Prophet ﷺ command him that that's not your job. That's not your role. Your role as citizens of Abyssinia, as people who have a visa in Abyssinia, a green card in Abyssinia, your role is merely to worship Allah. You don't have to get involved in thinking about the Khilafah and making Abyssinia Darul Islam. And yes, if you can talk to people of Islam, do so. And so you know what? Some of the people in Abyssinia converted to Islam. It is narrated that a delegation even came to the Prophet ﷺ and spoke with him because of the Muslims in Abyssinia. So they did their da'wah, yes, but it wasn't their ultimate goal to convert everybody. They didn't stay there for that reason. Why did they go to Abyssinia? Because they could worship Allah freely. That was the reason. When they are there and they're allowed to preach, they did preach and they did do that one. But that was not the reason why they went to Abyssinia. Therefore, from this, we can say, and this is the position that I hold now. So if somebody asks me the question, I know exactly what to say. And my response is, and I, I, by the way, I can say this freely, even though many Muslims don't like this response. And we can argue about this, and I want us to argue. You don't have to accept my position. My position is crystal clear. Our responsibility is to make sure that we can worship Allah as Muslims in our personal, private lives. This is our responsibility. We are like the Muslims of Abyssinia, and our job and our duty cannot be to betray Abyssinia. It cannot be to plot and plan against Abyssinia. Nobody who resides here legally is permitted to do that. That would go against the very contract that has been given to you. You have been given a contract of citizenship, a contract of visa. And a part of that contract means you will uphold our laws. And a Muslim is not a liar. A Muslim is not a cheat. A Muslim does not break his word. Once, listen to this, Udayfa ibn al-Yaman is fleeing from Mecca to Medina and he is caught along the way. This is during the Hijrah. He's caught along the way and they want to take him and his father back to Mecca. Him and his father are both fleeing to Medina. They know the story. Everybody knows what's happening. Muslims are leaving quietly from Medina, but the Quraysh don't want them to leave. They prevent everybody. So Udayfa and his father are caught by the Quraysh. They beg and they plead. They promise them money. So finally the Quraysh say, okay, we'll let you go, but with one condition that you don't fight us in war. This is a deep condition here. Listen to this. The Quraysh are willing to let Hudayfa and his father go as long as they don't fight them in battle. Don't attack us. Because at this time, the Muslims are attacking the caravans of Quraysh, right? Remember? The Muslims are attacking the caravans of Quraysh and the Quraysh are feeling the pinch. So the Quraysh say, if you go there, you cannot be amongst those people. So Hudayfa and his father, they don't know what to do, but their life is at stake. So they say, okay, we agree. We give you our solemn oath, our promise that we will not be amongst the attackers. This condition was never given before. Before. So they don't know what to do. So they come to the Prophet wasallam and they tell him the whole story. And it so happened that the battle of Badr is just about to take place. And so the Prophet wasallam said that the Muslim does not break his oath. So you will not participate in Badr and you will fulfill your promise to them. This is a profound hadith. The Muslims needed people to go fight at Badr. They needed every man, every man they could get, they needed. And yet when Hudayfa said, I gave a promise that I wouldn't fight, what do I do now? The Prophet said, Muslims don't break their promises. You cannot go. You and your father made that promise, so you stay behind in Medina. And so they did not participate in Badr. By entering this country, by taking up legal residence here, by paying these taxes and taking these services back from the government, we have a similar type of promise, a similar type of contract. And that is that we cannot plot and plan to subvert the country. This is an Islamic obligation. You cannot do this as a tricker, as a traitor, as a trickster, as a person who, who promises one thing and then breaks it. This is not the way of the believer. So when Hudayfa promised the Quraysh, even though his life was at stake, you know, Maybe some faqih would have said, you know what, they put a gun to your head, that promise is not valid. You know what, they're about to kill you, let's just ignore that. The Prophet of Allah Wasallam said, the Muslim does not break his promise. You do not fight, you stay behind. You are breaking your covenant and oath if you go against the very contract, the very treaty that you are holding.
So to return to the second issue, our ultimate goal in this land is to ensure that we can worship Allah in our personal lives. As for converting others and preaching, this is not the ultimate goal. This is a desire and there's a big difference between the two. We are Muslims. We believe Islam is the ultimate truth and we want to share it with other people and we will preach. We will tell others about it and we have a desire that others accept our religion. Just like evangelical Christians want the entire country to become a Christian country, I too as a Muslim have a desire. It's a desire that I want everybody to become a Muslim, but it's up to you. I will preach and teach. If you want to become, then Alhamdulillah. If not, that is your choice that you have to make and you have to answer for. So if somebody asks us, why are you living in this country? You say the exact same reason why you are. I want a good life in this world and also in the next and I think that this country can give me that. As long as you live your life as a practicing Muslim, you are sinless. You have done the minimum required of you.